right, welcome into the shop. Now we're gonna jump right into this build. This is a wooden sofa frame in walnut uh, that was ordered uh, by a client who lives in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, the cool thing about this video is we're actually gonna deliver it to him. At the end of the video, you'll get to see that. A couple things I wanna mention for this build before we start. One is I got full liberty to design this sofa myself, so I'm proud to say it is uh, my design. He wanted a Danish, kind of Danish modern feel some Japanese influence. Also, as we go through this build, I'm gonna be showing you digital renderings of the actual finished piece to help guide you along and kind of show you what we're doing, uh, make con help make context of what's happening. So let's get started. Obviously right now we are turning legs. So this um, couch has six legs to it that are all about an inch and five eighths round. Um, and I start by turning those on the lathe. Basically what I'm using as a parting tool here and I've got my caliper set to the diameter of my part and I just part it down throughout the whole length of the leg and then come back with a gouge and smooth it to size. So um, all, those, all these parting cuts I'm making are just basically a reference to go to. Uh, it helps me get the right size consistently across all six parts. Now a quick look at the sofa, you can see the six legs were turning. And like I said, as I go through, I'll use this as context to help you guys understand what I'm doing. This little sanding block really helps kind of even out any of the bumps, smooths it out, make sure that um, it's a nice, clean, um, smooth cylinder the whole way across. So we're gonna jump into joinery now. This is the side frame we're gonna be building. So we're cutting this mortise, I'll show you right here. It's actually on a seven degree angle. So there's a slight angle down uh, for where you sit. Um, and so this jig is gonna help provide the mortise and the angle. I'm adjusting a screw in the jig right now that tilts it. So if I let that screw out, I get more angle. If I put that screw in further, it zeroes it out. So I'm just using my workbench and a bevel to kind of reference and get the angle I want. I've got two routers to use this jig. One is going to cut what basically a pocket. So these are uh, housed Morrison tenons. This will make more sense as we get further into it. Uh, but this router has a smaller bushing and a quarter inch bit. So it's gonna cut that pocket. This has a bigger bushing that actually fits the opening of that jig and has a half inch bit. So this is cutting the mortise in the part. I've got to do this on all six legs. Not all of them are angled. Um, the top ones are not, but the ones that hold the seat frame are angled because we have that seat kind of sitting back at a seven degree angle. You're gonna get another shot of me doing it here. This will be more of a close up so you can see what's happened. So that's the larger pocket that we've cut. The actual rail of the sofa is gonna fit into that pocket and kind of bury into it. And then this is the half inch spiral bit with the full size bushing. It just cuts basically the mortise. Now the front, the two front corner posts have basically smaller tenons, so we have to overlap those because they're in the corner, or else they'd run into each other. So one of them, one tenon goes above the other one. So you'll see in this particular cut, we shorten the length of our mortise right there, so that we have one mortise going in low, and on the other side of the cylinder, one mortise going in high, so they kind of overlap each other. Now we've got to cut all of our tenons. We're going to do this on the Lee FMT morsing jig. I use this thing a lot. It's a great tool. It's a very quick, efficient way to cut out uh, tenons. This will also do mortises, but the particular way I'm having to cut the mortises, it was much easier just to use that jig I made and then match this up to that jig. Okay, so here we got, you can see the tenon cut there. Now this is one of the top rails of the, of the frame. So it has a tenon down low. We don't cut that tenon all the way at the top or else it just weakens the part. I um, mean, kind of see me fitting it there. Basically what I'm doing is just taking passes with the hand plane to get that part size down to fit the initial pocket that we cut. Once you sand it, it looks like 10 times better than you expected.
Man, this vise is just incredible. How you been using it? Yeah. Hey, bud. I got Judd in here helping me. He is very interested in what I've been doing lately, which is a lot of fun. It's great to have him up there trying to teach him the ropes. You can see how it all comes together right here. It's a really cool connection, very strong connection, and uh, I think it fits well for this particular part. This is the front middle post, the most complicated part on this piece. Uh, it has three parts coming into it. So it has that long front uh, rail and then it has a middle kind of rail that comes um, front to back. So we've already cut all the joinery for it using our jig, but we left it long so that we could use the jig. So now we can come back and actually cut it down uh, to size because the, the seat of the chair is actually going to be on top of this part. So we just left it long so that the jig would fit on there and we can make the cuts. So I'm cutting right on the top of those mortises and then we'll come back with chisels and kind of clean it all up and um, get those edges straightened out. It's a cool looking joint. I like the way it looks. There's going to be a lot of hand tool work in this particular piece, just in instances where you really need, you know, to jig this up and do this with a jig would take a lot of work and I feel fairly confident that I could do it by hand. So this is kind of a somewhat of a half lap happening here. We're cutting out a section of waste for that front rail to slide over and slip into this part. All this joinery is fairly complicated and I have a pretty comprehensive video over on my Patreon if you want to know why I choose the joints I do, why, I, you know, it's not necessarily how I cut the joints, it's more the thinking and logic and, um, you know, reasoning behind the joints that I'm using. I think it's a pretty cool video, so if you want to learn more about that, you can go sign up, become a Patreon, and uh, help support the channel and learn a little bit more about furniture making. So we made two saw cuts down. Now we're just going to take the waste out with a chisel. I've already worked from the other side. Uh, I didn't show that in this particular cut, but we've worked up from the other side. We flipped the part over. Now we're about to break that whole chunk of waste out. Here it goes. So I'll do some chisel work, kind of clean that up, and now we're going to go to that front long rail and get a data stack on a table saw and cut out the mating um, lap here. Now, visually this looks like a really bad idea because you're taking a lot of meat off this. It's a pretty high cut. But once you glue it all together and get it all locked in, it's plenty strong. So not only does it have that kind of dado lap, but it also has a dado on the faces as well. It helps kind of hold it in place and strengthens that joint. Always usually come off I'll come off my machines and hand fit joints. Um, you know, sometimes we go off the machine to a fit, but I like dialing in the fit with by hand. And so that little router plane there is a great tool to kind of shave that pocket down. Now you can see how it comes together. It's really cool joint and it's designed so that it can slide on in this way. And it'll make sense when we assemble the whole frame. It makes it really easy to put this whole frame together. So now we're moving on to a side rail of the chair. This is where the back seat rail hooks into the side of the sofa. We've got a double mortise and tenon here. Uh, we're going to go with the grain and make two tenons. That's, that's going to give you the best glue surface and uh, the most durable joint as opposed to going um, opposite direction and perpendicular to grain. You don't get as good glue, glue surface and that's really where the strength of your joint is, is in that long grain to long grain glue surface. So I just use the plunge router with a fence uh, to cut these two uh, mortises and then square them up. There's no shoulder on the, on the edges. They go all the way to the face of the piece. So I just square them up and then uh, we'll cut those mating tenons out uh, by hand. So we're just using marking gauges, laying out shoulders and tenons. And then I'm just going to come with a saw here and cut down on my uh, cheeks of all my tenons and then we'll take off the shoulders. So here we're coming back down, cutting our shoulder out. Now we obviously leave that waist in the middle. Um, I don't think I showed it in the video, but I knocked that out with a coping saw and then chisel to my layout line uh, to get it nice and clean.
that didn't use a coping saw, I'll stand corrected. Went old school and just chiseled it out. Uh, coping saw would be a little bit quicker. Um, couldn't tell you why I chose to do it this way, but this way works just as well. You can see how I don't start right on my layout line, come forward about a sixteenth of an inch, knock that waist out, and then I can go back to my layout line. Um, even here, I'm not on my layout line yet because I'm going to use a wider chisel on my layout line so that I'm not, you know, a wider chisel is a little bit better when you're making that final cut because it just cuts the whole um, surface there instead of a, a narrow chisel can kind of get offline and, and dig in uh, into your layout line. Flip it over, do the same on the other side, and then we'll do those finish cuts. All right, so you see there I got the wider chisel and uh, just going right to the layout line and getting a nice clean shoulder there and cleaning out all that waste. I think probably one of the more satisfying parts of cutting joinery is when you get to this point and start assembling things. There's so many joints in this sofa and uh, it's just a lot of, you know, you've got a week worth of work probably in just making parts and joints. Um, and here you get to see kind of things coming together. Those two side frames uh, get knocked together and then there's basically a middle frame as well. Uh, and so now what we can do is dry fit everything. Um, actually get to start see things coming together, but what I'm going to do now is lay out for the back slats. So there's, I think, 19 of these little half-inch dowels that we've made out of walnut. I'm spacing this out with dividers on where to drill my holes. This is kind of where I laid in what I thought was a little bit of Japanese influence. Most of the design to this point kind of feels more Danish modern, but these slats, um, you see a lot of that in the Japanese furniture. And so because of that, I wanted to put them in the sofa. Laying out uh, things like this is absolutely best done with dividers. You get accurate layout, you get accurate spacing, and it's just super easy. So if you need to space things out, I highly recommend you do it using dividers. This is a little jig I just made, um, super simple. I'm able to clamp it on using actually some Festool clamps, and uh, it's got the angle I need. Um, to drill my holes, just want to be careful because it is a wooden wooden guide. So if you get real off as you're drilling the holes, it can eat up your jig and start to get off. So I just really focus on drilling straight down in. It's not a very deep cut. It's about a half inch deep. We don't need to cut. We don't need to set these dowels in to that rail very deep. They just need to be captured and glued in place. Also, the blue tape always works to set your depth. And you can tell by right there that, you know, we're not going very deep on these. So it's, it's fairly simple to, to make sure you keep that at the right angle. And here you can kind of start to see the sofa coming together. I think it's looking super cool. I love the look of those slats in the back. Um, so it's exciting to see things starting to happen. More joinery here. This is the top rail. So what we just drilled holes into for those slats, the rail directly above those, that's going to capture them on, ta on top. This is the pocket for that to be held into. I'm not going to use the double mortise and tenons for this because it's going to have a frame that captures it in. It's not a part of the seat. The seat's where a lot of the stress in a chair is. This is just a pocket to hold it in place. And then um, as you'll see as we build more of this, there's a top frame that kind of captures it. Uh, so basically I'm just cutting little dados out at the angle I need. Uh, I've just got a little jig I made with double-sided tape that I can stick on the part and then chisel out the, the round corners to square. Pretty quick and easy uh, way to cut this joint. Okay, so this is that actual top rail. We're going to use a hand plane and dial them in to fit the pockets. Um, as I was saying earlier in the video, I always like to use hand tools to kind of dial in the fit. That's really the best way to get things to really fit together well. Quick test fit, make sure we're good. Should be able to just press fit that in there by hand. And yeah, that looks real good. I don't think I show it in the video, but we went back and used the jig and drilled the holes in that top slat 
uh, to catch those um, dowels that we made. So before we can do our, our assembly, um, we got to drill holes in the top of all the posts. We're going to put a, a walnut dowel in there and that's going to capture that top frame that we're going to make basically kind of an armrest. Uh, and so I do that last. It's really easy. If, if you don't cut the ends of your parts, you still have the turning uh, marks from your centers. So you can use that to line up your drill bit and a perfectly centered hole uh, to, to drive a dowel into. Okay, always a good idea to chamfer the bottom of your um, parts here. So anything that touches the floor, we want to put a nice chamfer on so if they drag the sofa or anything of that nature, it doesn't chip out and, and break uh, a section. Anything, tables, chairs, anything that comes in contact with the floor needs to have some chamfer around over on it. Otherwise, you know, when you drag it, it can catch and split out. I'm going to go ahead and pre-seal everything with shellac. This is a seal coat, the wax, uh, wax free shellac, a Zinzer product. Uh, it's just an easy way to, to seal all the parts down. I, I want to make sure I don't put any of it on the actual areas that need glue. Um, but the thing this really helps with is to clean the glue. So any squeeze out, I can immediately clean off just with water. And if you've built a lot of furniture, you know you can spend a lot of time chiseling, squeeze out, dry glue out of you know, joints. It can be very time consuming. So if you seal things up, it, oil would work just as well. First coat of oil, uh, you can clean the parts, the glue won't stick, and it just saves a ton of time. So this is one of the side frames. We get it glued up, after it dries, I bring it out of the clamps, and I'm gonna level this top rail off with the post. It needs to be um, really nice and level because we're gonna glue that armrest down on it, so I don't want you know, a gap or anything. I don't want that sitting proud. Now, I purposely leave it proud because it's much easier to plane it down. I just started there with a scrub plane, so I'm just taking really heavy cuts, and then I'll finish them off with this smoothing plane um, and get it nice and leveled out. Okay, so with those top rails leveled out, now we can assemble the entire frame. So now I'm gonna put those two long rails in, get those glued in place. One great thing about chairs is you don't necessarily have to leave clamps if you've got the joints right. You just seat them up, clean the squeeze out out. Uh, now a lot of times if you're having issues getting things to line up and, and to be square, clamps help. Um, you gotta be careful here clamping because these bar clamps, if you over tighten those long rails, especially with those joints, like I was saying earlier, that they're kind of weak right now, you can actually start to flex that part and snap it. Um, so you gotta be very mindful of that. So here we are putting in the middle section. This is what I was telling you earlier about how this will just slide up. This is all purposely thought out uh, with the joinery, um, the way I cut it so that I could assemble it easily. Um, so basically this will go underneath and just will tap down those two rails right on top of it. It's also thoughtful in the way you use it. So when you sit in this chair, all the downward pressure is going down into that joint. So mechanically, um, you're using the advantage of the joint. If I did things the other way around, you would actually be pushing the joints apart. Um, so a lot of thought goes into how you design joinery and, and how it should work. And like I mentioned earlier, I go into a lot of detail over on my Patreon about how uh, I designed that and came up with that. All right, so once that frame dries up, now this is just multiple glue ups here. We're gonna do the spindles. Um, so I've got all 19 of these. I put a little bit of glue in there um, just to keep any chance of these rattling down the road. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if something dries out or if you were a little loose on your fit and how you turned it, um, they can start to rattle and that can be annoying. So a little glue in there will prevent them from ever uh, ending up rattling. Pretty cool shot. I like this is a pretty cool shot. I like how everything appears to be lining up pretty good. So in this, I think these spindles really bring this chair, to, this sofa together, and kind of complete the design, uh, especially if you're looking at it from the back. 
So I got Robert's help here to drop in that top rail. You know, fitting in 19 dowels is not easy. So having an extra help, extra hand there uh, is super helpful. This is kind of a hybrid uh, miter joint here. The reason it looks like that is because the back, this is the long back piece. It's five inches wide, I think, but the armrests are only about three and a half. So you got a narrow part coming into a long part. So devise this kind of step, this kind of half uh, miter. Um, so I start with just making a jig of the shape of the miter I need, make it on the CNC. And flush trim it with a router use some double-sided tape and the clamp to hold it in place and then we'll make the matching part to fit into that okay so um, dropping it on kind of laying out that profile that shape we're gonna put on it making sure that everything fits kind of the way it should I'm gonna go to the bench now with a scrub plane kind of start with some heavy cuts and just hand shape this uh, between the scrub plane and um, my smoother, I can get through this pretty quick. So you can start to see that, that shape, that profile there. Now we're gonna take it and transfer it over onto our armrest and then hand carve. See, I've, I've cut a little bit of a step into the armrest miter and that allows us to uh, fit that profile and allow them to meet up. We just gotta hand carve it, scribe it, which I'm doing right now, and then carve it out to fit the profile we just shaped. Okay, so once we get those carved, we do a quick test fit and make sure everything comes together nicely. It looks really good. We're gonna reinforce, reinforce this joint after we glue it up. So what I've done is put some, I'm gonna glue it up directly on the bench because I want it, I, you know, things aren't always perfectly square. The armrest might be a little bit off. So I want it to, set the glue to set up exactly how I want this to lay on the bench. So we put a little blue tape down so we don't glue it to the bench accidentally and I just clamp it all together and clamp it on the bench and that way it's locked in and we know it's in the right spot. So once it dries, take it to the workbench, level out those miters, those joints. There's always going to be a little bit of um, work to do there and getting those leveled out. So I take the four and a half Stanley, my favorite hand plane, and just work that down. Walnut works beautifully, a lot of fun, and I'm about to get my helper in here and, and give him a little lesson on how to use the hand plane. Boys, what's up, bud? What you doing? Oh, I love those things. Hey, bud. What? You know what kind of wood this is? Uh, wood. You know what type of wood? What type of tree? Uh. Walnut. I shouldn't get that. Yeah, you should have. Move your stool. Oh. I'll get it. This hand right there. Okay. And put this hand right here. Push that hand to there. Hey, yeah, that's good work. Look, look what you made. Yay, I made this. Shavings. Yeah. That's cool, isn't it? Isn't that fun? All right. 
hand plane. Yeah. Do you know what type it. of wood this is? Uh, walnut. Yeah, that's right. Good job. All right, I gotta finish this up, okay? Thanks ah. for being such a good helper. Okay, so with everything leveled out, the help of Judd there, always appreciate it when he comes in and gives me a linden hand. Uh, we're going to cut splines into this. So the backstory to these is I kind of was racking my brain as to how am I going to cut these. These are really big. As you can tell, they go pretty far in. So table saw would be kind of awkward. And I don't even think possible. Um, and I was racking my brain a lot talking to Robert about it. And Robert's like, why don't you just cut them by hand? And I thought, well, that's a great idea. I don't know why I didn't think of that. I think maybe I thought I couldn't. It's a, this is actually really difficult to execute. And I was just like, well, I'll give it a shot. And it, it worked. I was very fortunate. <laughs> I think I got a little lucky because you got to make a big saw cut here. And if you get off at all, um, you kind of ruin the joint. And then you got to cut straight on your line. So I, I think when I do these things, I tend to kind of angle it safely away from um, my cutting line the problem is is this particular joint you can't really get in it there and fix that so you really have to try to execute perfectly off the saw and then I'm just gonna come back with this quarter inch chisel and just start hacking out waste um, and it starts to make sense right because it's just a quarter of an inch um, spline in there so getting a chisel in there and refining that um, opening is super difficult so you got to try to get it the best you can right off the saw which I, I, sometimes you just get lucky I, I, I think here I got a little bit lucky obviously there was some skill involved but um, it came out much better than I thought it would and I was I was happy about that because there's there was a chance here that I could have completely ruined this part um, by, by cutting at an angle and cutting into my line or cutting the other way and having to spend hours trying to you know, take out material to get it all leveled out. This is kind of the final chisel that I'm trying to go at the angle to create that bottom. Um, I'm going to probably overextend my quarter inch chisel here and likely bend it. You're going to see it right now. Uh, I tend to do things like this. I probably should be using a mortising chisel, much more stout of a chisel. You can see it right there. Hopefully it went back to straight, but that wasn't very nice to do to the tool. Should have had the mortising chisel in there, much more, much stronger chisel, um, beefier, can handle stuff like that. Leveraging with bench chisels is not really a good idea. Okay, so once I get those cut, I can now glue in a spline. You can see these are pretty large splines. Um, but I was very happy with how they came together. Um, we'll leave them big, just like this, let that glue set, and then uh, come back and get a handsaw and, and cut, them, cut them down to size. So I'm just kind of eyeballing, you know, roughly an eight three sixteenths here to leave. Um, I don't, I don't want, I didn't want to flush them up. I like the idea of leaving them slightly proud. Um, and also, I'm not a big fan of contrasting woods. A lot of people would be like, well, why don't you use contrasting wood? I, I probably might have used like an ebony or something, a darker wood, but I like for things like these details to be very subtle. Um, something that the someone who sees this might just accidentally find and say, oh, wow, that's cool. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't expected. I, I don't like to be, I don't want to say showy because I don't, I don't necessarily think contrasting wood is showy, but I think it, it draws your eye in too quick. I think people need to find a lot of these details, and I think um, it's just, I like things to be subtle. That's just the way I am. That's my style, um, and I, nothing wrong with contrasting woods, but for me, the subtle little details that you have to kind of look for um, are the best. 
So I'll clean that up, clean those saw marks off with the hand plane, get it nice and uh, pretty looking, and then do a little sanding. And then this thing's about ready to drop onto the bench. Now I did not show it in the video, but um, I did have to lay everything, the whole sofa upside down on the frame and mark out where those dowels were and drill the holes, um, which wasn't an easy task to say the least, but I did get it and everything lined up. And so it just hammers right on, a little bit of glue and some clamps. You glue the dowels, you can glue all along those top rails and just clamp it all down. It just kind of locks everything in and it caps it off and gives it that nice finishing look. I think it's a cool um, little detail, especially looking at those corner uh, splines. Those things are slick looking. I love the way those look. Okay, a couple quick things I want to say before we hit the road and deliver this piece to Taos, New Mexico. Um, first off, I think um, over the last 10 years I've been in business, I, I've come to realize how grateful I am for the clients that I've been able to work with. And uh, Mike, who I built this sofa for, is no different. I had a lot of fun working with him, designing the sofa. There was many phone calls, um, a lot of going back and forth. And, you know, the cool thing about this piece is very rarely do I get to build something. I shouldn't say rarely, but not often do I get to build something that I completely get to design on my own. Most clients who come to me already have an idea of what they want, or even like interior designers, they want exactly what they want, and I just have to build uh, what they want, and that's fine. That pays the bills, and I get to build cool pieces and things I probably would never build outside of that. But it is really cool when a client comes to you and is like, hey, I want you to design this. Here are kind of the parameters. I think you'll come up with something cool. And that was kind of the case with this sofa. And in a very like positive, good way, I'm very proud of this build. Uh, and how this came out, and um, I'm just grateful for uh, Mike for the for the opportunity to build it, and for the relationship that's been established through that process. And driving out to Taos to meet him and deliver was really the icing on the cake. Uh, it was a great opportunity to hitch up the Argosy. First time we've taken it out of state. My wife and I went on a trip together. It was a quick one. We took off on Friday drove all the way in one day um, and I just prayed the whole time that it would not rain because we, we you know Robert and I loaded the sofa and we wrapped it in plastic and blankets and it was pretty pretty secure back there but a torrential downpour would probably have soaked it and so I was the whole time we're driving up there we're splitting rain clouds and there's rain here and we did hit some rain for a little while but luckily the the piece itself was able to stay dry so it was a quick weekend but it was a lot of fun um, let's jump in and share some of this uh, delivery footage. Hope you enjoy it. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Always appreciate y'all watching the videos. Make sure to leave a comment. Let me know what you think of this sofa. And until maybe the end of the year, I'll see you next time. Comfy. I might. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
came from that buyer. And then these actually have tenons going up into it here, so this is all attached and glued on. Uh huh. It's pretty cool, man. And then these are, you know, you've got a square part going into the round part, so these are kind of, it's called a house more some tenon, so this part goes, has a tenon, but it also, this whole thing goes inside of the part, so that so it fits, it fits in there nice. Yeah, it looks clean.